Can you believe where I'm standing? I'm standing right here in the field. I'm talking about the spot where the shepherds were hanging out, pulling an all-nighter, tending their flocks. These guys were common people. They were outcasts. They were people that, that, that were like, man, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a shepherd. And here they are. I've always thought about these guys, you know, sipping stale coffee from 7-Eleven or something like that, just looking at the stars, just going, man, another night. And a lot of people think the shepherds were actually tending the sheep that were used as sacrifices in the temple, which is very interesting. So here they are, they're just, you know, standing around. And you, you know this is the area because obviously this is called the shepherd's fields and there are a number of caves in, in, in certain places. And, and we, we know this is probably where Mary and Joseph showed up and, 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 and they made their journey to the end and all that. But I wanna go back to the shepherds. Jesus is born, they're with their flock. They receive the greatest message in the universe. Now we love to give and receive messages. We're always sending people messages, text messages, and we direct message people. We send messages to people on Instagram. We even use sticky notes if you're old school. We're always writing down these messages. I'll be frank with you, most of the messages I receive, I mean, I'll just scroll through them, whatever. Okay, that's important. Now and then though, I'll get one that's like, wow, amazing. It'll, it'll, it'll snap my head, so to speak. Well, the message that the shepherds received was the most miraculous message ever. This message is miraculous because these guys were out there and the angels show up. And if you think about angels, angels are simply God's messengers. They show up and they tell the shepherds the deal. They give them the skinny on the whole situation. They say, hey, Jesus has been born. And I'm, and I'm kind of giving the cliff notes here, but, but when they received the message, the shepherds, the Bible says they hurried off and ran to the crib. I like that, I like that word crib, a crucial relationship initiated by the Savior of the world. They obviously worshiped him and all the angels, of course, were worshiping during this time, during this miraculous moment. Then the shepherds spun on their heels and they spread the word. Think about a mass email. Think about just using your thumbs, texting everybody you know. Think about just, just shouting it from the mountaintops. They were telling everybody about this amazing news. They spread the word. And the Bible says people were amazed. And we're gonna talk about over the next couple of moments, this miraculous story. We're gonna talk about the real meaning of it and the motivation of it. Well, let's look at another aspect of this message. Christmas is definitely a time of stories. The story of the squad of shepherds seeing an angel being the first ones ever to hear about the good news of Jesus. Speaking of stories, I heard about a 10-year-old kid and he really wanted a bicycle. It was several days before Christmas and he was just wearing his parents out. Mom, Dad, I want a bike, I want a bike, I want a bike. Finally, his mom said, son, I've had enough. I don't wanna hear another word about this Christmas bike. You know, she was all stressed out with all the family being in town and everything. And the mom said, you go up to your room and if you really want a bike, Son, why don't you just talk to God about it? Just, just pray about it. He goes, yes, ma'am. So he walks upstairs to his room. He starts praying. And, and the mom hears this screaming and yelling coming from his room. Dear God, I want a new bike. I want a bike. Lord, help me get a bike. She ran up to his room, opened the door, and she said, what are you doing? You don't pray like that, God's not deaf. And the kid said, I know God's not deaf, but grandma is. <laughs> the shepherds definitely weren't deaf. I want you to think about the sea change in Luke chapter two, and most of us have heard this story. The Bible says matter-of-factly in Luke chapter two, verse seven, 
And she, Mary, brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And just all of a sudden, the next verse, verse eight, now they were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Doesn't that seem rather odd, sort of strange, sort of unusual? All of a sudden you're talking about Jesus being born of a virgin. That's a miracle. And then the next verse, and by the way, there were some shepherds, a squad of shepherds just minding their own business, pulling an all-nighter, sipping espresso, just doing what they do. I thought about myself so many times, I just skip over that. So many times I don't really think about that. So many times I'm thinking, okay, the shepherds, all right, whatever, whatever. But just for a second, I want us to to zoom in on the shepherds. Why the shepherds? Uh, I mean, what's the meaning? What's the motivation behind a bunch of low-class, outcast shepherds? You saw me in the shepherd's fields, and when we think about a field, we think about a flat field, like a pasture, but over there in that area outside of Bethlehem, very rocky, very tough, very unforgiving. These shepherds were looking to see what the situation was. They were, they were outcast. They were looking to see if any animals would come in and take the sheep. Shepherds They couldn't even worship in the temple. Shepherds, they buried the dead. Shepherds, their witness couldn't be used in the court of law. Shepherds? A squad of shepherds. If a baby's born to British royalty, it's not first announced to cab drivers or longshoremen, is it? Oh no, the A-listers, man, the TMZers, the multi-squillionaires, they're the first ones to hear. And if I'm writing this script, I'm going, okay, Jesus is born, well, in the Ritz-Carlton, right? And, 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 and we're, we're doing this mass email and we're DMing all of these major players to bring them in, but shepherds, the lowest of the low, why shepherds? Several reasons. Number one, shepherds were so low They were so destitute and downtrodden that we can connect with them. In other words, they were the first responders. I would argue they were the first ones to become followers of Christ in this context. So that tells you and me that we can come to Jesus no matter who we are, no matter how high or how low, whether we're a billionaire or on welfare, it doesn't matter how far away we think we are from God. The universality of the gospel is in play right there. So that's awesome, man. I think that's one of the reasons. Now, another reason, and whenever you read the Bible, there's always this one meaning, and many times there's a deeper surface uh, uh, kind of a, a vibe going on. Another reason why I believe the shepherds were the first ones and the only ones to get this birth announcement was the fact that they were shepherds. Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Jesus uh, was known as a shepherd. He was also known as a lamb. What happened when he began his public ministry? John the Baptist looked at him and said, oh, hey, hey, there's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the shepherds were tending sheep that most scholars feel were used as sacrifices in the temple, yet the shepherds left their lambs to go and worship the lamb. So really, I'm like, no wonder. That's the perfect audience to receive the birth announcement of Jesus. Why the shepherds? Why the shepherds? The universality of the gospel. Why the shepherds? Because that's who Jesus compared himself to, that's who, that's who he was. Angels show up. Now you might be saying, angels, Ed, in this rationalistic world, you're, you're telling me angels, heavenly beings came down. Well, the scripture tells us, again, just straight up, and behold, an angel, verse nine, of the Lord stood before them. Read here in the original language, stood over them. 
And the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were greatly afraid. I love the honesty. I would be freaked too, wouldn't you? They're just pulling an all-nighter. <gasps> Gabriel shows up. Gabriel always was the angel who gave messages. He, he was like, we would say in modern day vernacular, over social media. <laughs> Seriously, study the angels in the Bible. Now, a lot of times we go, I have a hard time believing that, but, but think about what the eye can't see. Have you ever thought about that? God just briefly pulls back the curtains of the, the supernatural and gives them a shot of the supernatural. But think about what your eye can't see. My eye, your eye, we can't see atoms, we can't see molecules, we can't see infrared light, we can't see germs, we can't see the Dallas Cowboys winning the Super Bowl this year. We can't see a lot of things. No, the Cowboys are gonna win it. We're on a roll. I said that for a joke. And then you think about quantum physics. Quantum physics suggests that past, present, and future are happening now. And, and what does the Bible say about God? A year is like a thousand, or a day is like a thousand, and a thousand is like a day. So, so yeah, there, there are all sorts of things. I mean, I've never seen a thought, have you? I've never seen determination. I've seen the result of it, but I've not seen it. So, so this is not a, a far reach. It's just an angel communicating to a bunch of first century ranch hands about the birth of Jesus. Don't be afraid, it says. And then in verse 10, the angel said, don't be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be, there's a the word again, the inclusivity of the gospel for all people. Now, I've flown over the word behold many, many times. The word behold means to, to grasp, to, to relish. And the writer is saying if we grasp and relish the fact that good tidings, being Jesus Christ, have arrived on earth, then that should flatten any phobia or any fear that you deal with or that I deal with, but, but fear is real. You, you read about man and, and man had this perfect thing going on prior to sin, and then in Genesis chapter three, you have God and man dealing with each other and man dealing and God dealing with the consequences of sin, and that's the first time you have fear entering the equation of human existence. It's just something that we deal with, fear, fear. We fear rejection, we fear loneliness, we fear the future. It's, it's amazing all the fears that we deal with. Well, these angels are like, guys, I know you're fearful. And anytime someone in the Bible gets near to God, boom, they're gonna be fearful. Because I'm reminded, you're reminded of, wow, I'm not in control. These angels are saying, focus on Jesus. Focus on the Savior. Focus on the babe of Bethlehem. Because prior to sin, there was no such thing as fear. After sin, after we tried to gain control, that's when you have fear. So whenever I try to run the show and say, I'm the man, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, it's just a matter of time before fear hits on the coastline of my life. Well, the angels say, verse 11, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Christ the Lord. And then it says suddenly a choir, another squad, joined this squad of shepherds, but they were a squad of angels singing at night in Bethlehem. So I want you to note here real quick, they received the message. They just received the message. And in, in a crowd this size and at our 13 different locations, we're receiving this message. And I think that's awesome. We've received the message through singing, through short video. You receive messages, hopefully, by eating the cookies and drinking the hot cocoa and coffee and all that. We, we, have, this, we have this message going on. This is a place of a message. And it's our prayer that you don't scroll past the message or delete the message, that you take the message to heart, personalize it, and do something with it. What I want you to notice about this situation with the shepherds is simply this. 
This situation tells us more about God than it does the shepherds. In other words, God is working and it's called the sovereignty of God. He's supernaturally synchronizing your life and mine to meet at this moment in time. Yes, the shepherds were seeking. God was even seeking them more. You're here for a divine reason. So I pray you hear this message, that you hear it and do something with it. But it's easy just to hear something and not do anything with it. I've done that a lot. I mean, I'm married. I've done that a bunch. <laughs> Notice too, not only did they receive this message, but they also responded. And if you think about it, let me, let me kind of jump ahead a little bit. When you, when you hear the message and then respond, that equals faith. So, so I hear something, okay, I hear you, man. I got you, you know. I'll pick it up when you're lying down, whatever. I got you, all right. But when I do something about it, like in this context, I receive it and move out, that's faith. The shepherds didn't just stand there frozen in fear on the mountain. Whoa, man, dude, did you see that? That was awesome. A squad of shepherds seeing some angels. Wow, that was incredible. Let's just stand here. Let's not move. No, they didn't do that. They hustled. They cruised to the crib. Let's keep cruising ourselves. They responded. Look at verse 15. So it was, verse 15. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, let us go now, like, like right now. Don't put it off now to Bethlehem and see this thing that's come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they, the Bible says, they moved out with haste and found, and the word found here means after an intense search, but we know who was really searching, they found Mary and Joseph. Then I love the last thing after they responded, after they had, had received this word, they retold about what had happened to them. So they, they leave after they worship and they're telling others about what happened to them. That's what they did. So the shepherds heard it from the angels and now the shepherds are telling other people about, here's what happened to me. No, I'm not a theologian. No, I didn't go to seminary, but here's what happened to me. And the Bible says, people were amazed. Again, the shepherds were the first ones to have faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I'll say it again, you hear, plus you're in a hurry, that equals faith. And that's what happened here. Faith, faith, faith. But see, I have a tough time surrendering to God. It's my human nature, so do you. I have a tough time saying, God, you're in control. I'm not. And here's, here's how people do it. It's, it, it's sly how we do it. There, there are two ways we show our hostility toward God ruling in our lives. The first way is very overt. It's like, God, I'm the man. I'm gonna do what I've gotta do. Sorry, don't rain on my parade. I am going to sovereignly rule over this universe called me. And we know people like that. Now, the next one is covert. This is super slide. This is the religious person, because they're both about control, who says, I'm going to obey the Bible and do kind of what the Bible says. And because I'm doing what the Bible says, God has got to bless me. They're both about control. Becoming a follower of Christ is surrendering control. Once we surrender control, then we'll gain control because God is leading the show and we're made for him to live inside our lives. I like too how the shepherds worshiped. After they had this experience, they worshiped the Lord. Everybody here worships. You're gonna worship something or someone. To worship means to put someone or something on a high level, to show high esteem. When I was a kid, I was 13 years old, I worshiped a boat. I'm telling you, I did. 
And it was the best Christmas of my life because we ran into the living room. I got a few little things. And then my mother opened the curtains. She goes, Ann, look outside. And there was my father dragging this 12-foot Kmart. You remember Kmart? Kmart, kids. We have a blue light special on rowboats. Anyway, drug this boat in the front yard. I was like, ah. I mean, I was worshiping that boat. We lived kind of out in the country. We carried it through the woods to the lake. I was paddling around. I loved it. I loved it. Yet, it wasn't enough for me. I mean, I was worshiping the boat, but it wasn't enough. I wanted to have the boat painted like the professional fisherman on television. I said, Dad, would you help me carry it from the bank of the lake through the woods up our driveway so I could paint it? He goes, yes. I'll be home at 6 o'clock p.m. I waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. And at about 3 o'clock, I said, you know what? I'm going to do it myself. Although he told me not to. I'm going to do it myself. So I grabbed that boat, pulled it through the woods, and pulled it across the road, pulled it up our driveway, and I noticed some sparks kind of popping out of the back. I didn't think anything about it. Took it to the yard, began to paint it. I was, you know, impressed by my artistic talents. Dad shows up. He goes, Ed, what is the boat doing in the yard? Didn't I tell you to wait until I could help you move it? And I said, yes, sir. Because, you know, Dad taught me how to say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. That's something we need to adopt, you know. You know, you know what I can't stand? Just let me, have a, let, me, let me have a moment. When people say this, no problem. So there's like a problem? Just say my pleasure, okay? No problem. Or how about this? No worries. So we're worried about something? Where was I? The boat, dad, getting mad at me. Yeah, he said, son, son, son. Uh, uh, let, me, let me look at this boat. How'd you? And I told him I drug it up the driveway. Do you realize there's a hole in the back? You drug a hole in the back of the boat. And I looked into my shock. This object that I worshiped had a hole in it. Dad spun on his heels and went inside. I tried for years to fix that hole. Couldn't do it. I would paddle out in the lake, do some fishing. In about 45 minutes, the water level would rise in the boat, I would paddle it back to the bank, up and back, up and back, up and back. It never worked. I didn't obey the voice of the Father. It's our prayer that you obey the voice of God. Because maybe just maybe you're here and you're like, you know what, I thought making my first deal or my first million, that would carry me, but there's a hole in your boat. Or maybe if I could be with that, person or that situation or, or, or have those letters before and after my name, that would do it, but, but you're sinking. Obey the voice of God. God is worthy of our worship. He wants to know you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Those shepherds understood that. But it's just a, it's a crazy story about the shepherds. On one minute, on one hand, they were in the dark, and boom, they were in the light. They were unclean, yet their soul was power washed, and they became clean. They heard the message, and they saw it, and appropriated it into their lives as they moved from being far away to having this personal relationship with the Lord. So this service has left a message. It's left a message, first of all, in my life and in yours. Don't delete it. Don't scroll past it. Think about it. It's our prayer that this message will stop you and, and literally rock your world, that you'll be ambushed and power washed by the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus. Because Jesus crawled out of the crib, lived a sinless life, died 
a sacrificial death, totally righteous for your sins and mine, rose again, conquered the grave. That is the good news. The gospel is the good news. That's why the angel said, hey guys, hey, put your coffee cups down. I bring you good tidings of great joy because unto you in the city of David, a savior is born who is Christ the Lord.